Jeremiah chapter 4. If thou will return, it's God using Jeremiah to speak to Israel, already in captivity, in Judah, who's going to go into captivity. God wants the people to repent. Now, today's churches, when I say churches, I mean any denomination and non-denomination. There's no repentance, there's no sin, there's no hell. Is God hates the sin and just loves every sinner. And that's not correct. And I've heard Christians, oh, you know, it's wrong to say turn or burn. If thou will return, return is repentance. Watch. Oh, Israel, say the Lord, turn unto me, not the gods, not the religion. And if thou will put away thy abomination, there is the repentance and there is a work with repentance, and you turn from it, and you avoid it. I say avoid because, you know, some sins are easy to give up than other sins. It, I fought the sin of smoking. Alcohol, boom, that put it away. And there are sins in my life today that I battle. And I may never get that victory. But I don't want to do them. And I confess them, and I repent, and I try to avoid those sins. I mean, there, there, you know, can a Christian go out and murder somebody? Yes. And be saved? Yes. You don't want to. And then on the other side of the coin, there are Christians who want to sin. They want to do wrong. They want God to approve of it. And that's not correct. And that's an empty repentance. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you come to God, and, and let's use a cruel sin, you're lying in bed with, a, with an opposite person that's not your spouse, and you're about to come to the again sexually committing adult. Oh God, forgive me for this act. No. And you got a cigarette, right? And you're about to the light it and you're like, God, I shouldn't be doing. I know I'm bad. I shouldn't be doing. And you put it back in a pack, and, or you put it on the ground. You stomp it out. Now you may go back and relight that cigarette. You may go back and take that cigarette. You may go back and buy another pack of cigarettes. But you're fighting. Christian life is fighting sin. If you put away thy abomination, that's repentance and putting away and confession out of my sight so God don't see it. What do you do with that one? What do you do when God says, I don't even want to see it? Behold the eyes of the Lord in every place, behold the evil and the good. In order for God not to see it, you ought not to be doing it and there ought not to be in your life. Now, the modern liberal Christian has just come upon this, this first few minutes and he's turned me off. He goes, Shall thou not be removed if you don't repent, if you don't get right? Israel won't re repent and get right. They went into captivity. Judah's not going to repent and get right. They're going to cling to their gods. They're going to clean to their, uh, uh, their idols and their worship and religion. And they're going to go to Babylon. Whereas God could chase, chasing you, God could kill you. And thou shalt swear. Here's an oath. Now, and a Christian again, you know, thou shalt not swear. God said, you're going to swear. The Lord liveth in truth. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And today, this day and age, all over the world, what on earth is true? You're not getting it out of the fake media. I, every once in a while, I go back and, and I revalidate the, the documentaries about the, about the Titanic. I'm kind of interested in the Titanic. And I, I, and I came across a documentary the other day I was watching. And how the media in America. There was one point after the Titanic, the, the reports had sunk. That the media had reported everybody was was saved on the ship. So there was a time that all America and England, oh, our husbands, our, our, our wives, our children are coming home. Saved. And then it was reported 
No, not everybody made it. Then they were reported that there were bo dead bodies in, in the water. Then they reported that lifeboats weren't full. Then they reported there there has been fake news of the Titanic. There was fake news in the Civil War. And the North printed stories for their glamour, and the South printed stories for their glamour. And I, I, I read I read the accounts of the Civil War. And when you and it's funny when you put the two papers together, like did we fight the same war? And there was there were things where the North paper said about I don't know, this one battle city. Well, you know, we, we didn't lose much casualties in, in the South. They lost tons of them. And then the South newspaper said, you know, we did well. And the North lost tons of casualties. Frank, just get your word from Bible-believing, Bible, and missionary. In judgment, God is a God of love, but God is a God of judgment over sin. He's a holy and righteous God. He must judge sin when man don't judge his sin. We are to judge ourselves. Now he may not judge us. And other people say, don't judge not, you should be judged. Listen, if I don't tell you what's happened, I don't tell you about your life. You're not going to know. And righteous. God's always right. And the nation shall be Bless themselves in him. Now the Jew was also to be blessed in Genesis 10, 19 and 22, 18. And that would be the forerunner of Jesus coming from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah. But God will be blessed by all. Whether Jew or Gentile, you obey God at his word. Abraham wasn't Jew, or, uh, Jew and he obeyed God. And we have his story. Naaman was a Gentile and he obeyed God. We have his story. The Ninevites that Jonah went to preach to, they were Gentile. They obeyed the word of God. We have their story. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your house, your fallow ground. Break up that ground. You can't go on ground that's not been broken or plowed and expect a right full crop. Because if you just throw your seed out there, rain could wash it away, the birds could wash it away. There's the, po the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4. Sow not among thorns. Now the sowing is Matthew 13, Mark 4, the word of God. Thorns is the result of the curse, Genesis 3. What is a great illustration of that for the church age today? Alright, you got the word of God. We're a King James Bible believing church. Good. What's the thorn? You also celebrate Christmas, the birthday of Jesus. You got your seeds in the thorn. W what did it say in the parable? It choked the word. All right? W what's another case? You got your word out and you got S star. You call it Easter. Resurrection Sunday. You mean 10 days before Jesus Christ actually died on the calendar and that the resurrection of that year, this year, would have been, I think, Friday? Now you've done what the Catholics done. Good Friday, you get three days and three nights out of Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Now you try to get three days and three nights out of eight days. That's the Catholics. You're doing the same thing that Catholics do with another name. You got the King James Bible, but you got it amongst thorns. Everybody's welcome. Everybody can come. That's not the definition of church. Come to church. That's not the invitation to come to the church. <coughs> when Jesus said to preach the gospel, you can't come to the church when you're lost. That's taking the word of God and you're putting them on thorns. And the church has all kinds of thorns. And they may be a King James Bible. And listen, uh, there's another thing I've been coming up lately. All right, people say, well, they're hypocrites. Yeah, there's hypocrites in the church. I'm one of them. I ain't battling the hypocrites in the church. I'm battling the hypocrites that come out of that pulpit or podium. 
And the hip the hypocrisy that comes out of that pulpit or out of that podium. That's the thorns. And go back and read Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4. The word of God's being choked. Scripture with scripture. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. All right, that's a physical operation. You say males, take away the foreskins of your heart. That's not just man, that's female. Yeah, there's a circumcision. But there's also a circumcision of the Bible of the heart. God says you've got a vile and wicked heart. The Bible says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession made unto salvation. You can say all you want, you can pray all you want, but if your heart doesn't believe, there is no salvation. How come that verse is not in Romans rule? God wants your heart. He doesn't want that other little member, and you can't apply that application to the females. And yet, Islam has a circumcision for the female. It's gross. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come up forth like a fire. God is a God of fire. Our God's a consuming fire. If you don't change your heart, repentance, verse 1, my fury is going to burn. And literally, literally, the, 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 the walls in the city burn. Also pictures hell. And burn that none can quench it. There's hell because of the evil of your doing. You didn't repent. You stayed in the evil. You didn't get your heart right. You can confess and not have your heart right. The Bible says in Corinthians, I forget it's first or second Corinthians, there is a heart that, you know what? God, I'm sorry. And you're broken, contrary. You're just broken. David. When he was revealed to him by the Lord that he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against Uriah, but he sinned against God. That's a proper sorrowful heart in this prayer. And if you go watch these, these court and prison documentaries they have, and there are people go before the, the judge, and already they're going to have the tears. They're going to get choked up. They're going to be, oh, I'm just so sorry. And then when the judge lightens their sentence, they get out of the court, ha, I fooled them. That's worldly sorrow. That's crocodile tears. That sorrow does not bring repentance, does not bring favor with God or man. Declare ye in Judah. Now he's talking to Jeremiah. And publish in Jerusalem. They blow ye the trumpet. And that blowing the trumpet is called to assembly in the land. Cry, gather together, Israel, Judah. Assemble yourselves. Let us go into defense. Let's run to a armored city. Set the standard. That's a flag. Towards Zion. Retire. Stay not. I will bring evil from the north, Babylon, Nineveh, and a great destruction. Go into the defense cities, run and hide. Set up the flag. God says, I'm still going to bring that destruction. Get in the defense city. Ain't going to defend you against me and my army. At the end of the tribulation period, when Jesus is coming, they're going to take their, their, their idols and their God. They're going to throw them to the moles and rats. They're going to throw them into the holes of the cave. And they're going to say to the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the God of all gods, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. It ain't going to help them. It ain't going to help them. It won't help them at all. What defense can you come against God? I mean, they got the stupid question, is there a rock so big that God can't lift? Oh, yeah. A stony rock hard that won't 
break and repent. Now, can you go anywhere and hide from an angry, wrathful, judgmental God that's coming to get you? Think about that. The lion. That typifies the devil. That also typifies the emblem of Babylon. And many other countries. It's come up from his thicket. The destroyer of the Gentiles on his way, Nebuchadnezzar. And his way is gone forth from his place, Babylon, to make thy land desolate. God says he's on his way. Jeremiah preached the word. Jeremiah preached the word. Jeremiah preached the word. And they don't listen. And they don't listen. And they don't listen. I read the book of Jeremiah. And I studied the book of Jeremiah. They don't listen. And we'll see that. And thy city shall lay waste without inhabitant. But you're in the big defense cities. You're in the fortified cities. It didn't help you. You think America's great in her military. You think that's going to stop God? Germany had great power. It didn't stop it didn't stop God. For this gird you with sackcloth, and it's repenting, it's getting down to earth, it's getting down to the bare essential. You're seriously repenting. Lament. We got a book called Lamentation. It's an outcry. And howl, animal like. For the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. Again, that's Nineveh coming, Assyria coming for Israel, and is Babylon going to come from Judah? And go for it. Do it. Because they turned not. They did not repent. It's not God's fault. God sent prophets. God told them what to do. And they didn't listen. And for Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. When they have nothing. No gold. No silver. No precious stone. No inheritance. You had the Bible. You had good men out there. Though they were few. You didn't want to listen. And the people of the great white throne judgment, we, uh, God sent the prophets, God sent the preachers, God sent, you didn't want to listen. Your shame. It shall come to pass at that day, it's an important statement, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish. He's going to die. And you're going to see the last king ever in Judah besides Jesus Christ. And the heart of the princes. And the priests shall be astonished. They're going to be, oh, what on earth? When the temple is destroyed. And when the priests are standing with Ezra and Nehemiah. What the heck happened here? The judgment of God. When Nehemiah goes for a walk with his ass. And he's walking along. He can't even go any further. Because of the destruction and the rubble. Babylon did a serious, great job for the Lord. And the prophets shall wonder. No, it's plural. Jeremiah wondered so much, he writes the book of Lamentations. And he's the writer and the author of Jeremiah. Through the, and he's sitting back, like, oh, you can't believe what happened to this place. And there are proper Christians out there at the judgment seat of Christ and they've been judged. And they're going to be in limitations of people they went to church with and, and people that they sat under. And they're going to see that they have lost. And you imagine going up to a Christian putting your arm around and saying, I, what is your problem? I tried to tell you. I tried to help you. And you turned me away. Where is your Hebrew and Greek? Where is that Christian that reported me for my foul statements on Facebook that God said I was correct and you were wrong? Where is it? Bend over. Let me see your rewards. Let me see the rewards on your head if you have any. You want a head count? How many heads are at the at the great white throne judgment going to the lake of fire thinking that they were saved and they weren't? And you were... 
I hope I don't have anybody that did. If I have anybody going to the Great White Throne Judgment thinking they were saved and they weren't, uh, they were misled. I didn't mislead them. If there's anything that God will say that person should have got saved, but you know, you went caution to the wind a little too far. I'd rather go caution in the wind too far than have somebody say a prayer and not earn it. And I, listen, people have gotten saved. Lord, use that with, with me being there. And there have been people who are about to say a prayer, and I don't think it was real. And I back off and gave them a gospel track and say, listen, will you read one chapter of the Gospel of John tonight and pray to the Lord? Then said I, this is Jeremiah, Oh, Lord God, surely thou hast deceived this people in Jerusalem. <laughs> That's Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah saying that. Lord, you deceived the people, saying ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches unto the... God, you're saying war and sword is coming, but peace. Now, I'm quite sure Jeremiah was looking to Calvary when he made that statement. Wait a minute. You're talking about peace, God. Haven't we read about the millennium? Have we not talked about the second act? Peace. But then there's great war and there's great destruction. At that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind Eat of the high places that has to do with false worship in the wilderness towards the daughter of my people Israel not to fan not to cleanse now what is that? that fanning is the widower's fan and that would be when they're breaking the chaff of the wheat and they ride upon the cars and, they, and, they, and, and it breaks apart the wheat. They, they take that, that, that wheat, they throw it up in the air, and the wind blows away the chaff of worthlessness. And down falls the curtain. And they keep doing that. So there's nothing but kernel, and all the, most of the waste has been blown away. It's winnowing. And then he says, the cleanse. Have you ever just sat somewhere and watched the wind? I, I, I've been in many street ministries. And I've been sitting there holding a sign, giving up gospel tracts, preach. I just sat there and I watched the wind blow stuff away. Leaves and garbage. And you know what, what God's wind is? It's a rake. Let me just blow that stuff away. It cleanses the area. Even a full wind from whom places shall come unto me. Now will I also give sentence against them. God's saying, here comes a wind, here comes an army. And that wind is going to take all the chaff, the people, and just blow them away. And that wind is going to cleanse the land, it's going to carry people back to Babylon. The troops are going to come in, they're going to eat all the figs, they're going to eat all the grapes, they're going to drink all the wine, and they're going to destroy all the houses. Read the account in Nehemiah when he describes the city. When Ezra describes the temple. Behold, he shall come up, can't read my note, as clouds, and very important as clouds. Clouds has a reference to God in the second advent. Jesus comes and goes with clouds. And his chariots would be Babylon shall be as a whirlwind and destruction. You ever see the path of, of a tornado when they say a tornado touchdown? Destruction. There are things that were there you can't find no more. And they don't ever know what happened to him. A guy could have his car parked in the, in the driveway and, the, and his house and everything destroyed. And they come up out of the cell, where's the car? Well, there's a wash machine in the tree. It don't belong there. 
There's a bathtub way down the valley. There's our neighbor dead in, in the front lawn. Where did the car go? There are things been destroyed by a tornado. They don't know where. His horses are swifter than eagle. Talk about horsepower. Woe unto us, Israel, for we are spoiled. That means they're going to take everything they want. You realize there's a point in the Bible that God says, as far as the Babylonian army, you know, I didn't, I didn't give them no wages. We'll read that in Jeremiah. Tell you what. Go down to Egypt and sack Egypt. For your wages, what you did to Jerusalem and Judah. We'll come across that, Lord willing, in Jeremiah. Babylon comes and they sack and they spoil Israel. God said, that wasn't enough for you guys to be paid. You guys did an awesome, did great job. Though you cursed Israel and I got to curse you. Old Jerusalem, wash thy heart from wickedness. There's that heart issue again. You want a revival? It begins in your heart. Not in your church. A revival doesn't begin in Washington, D.C. It begins in the heart. You're not going to see a national revival. Those are gone. You're not going to see a church revival. That lasts for a week. I've been in church revivals. I've been, you know, we have a week long, we rally up, everything gets great and all, and all the flesh is. And I've seen the following Sunday, the following week, it died. It don't stay. Because you're not going to have that revival when you don't have it daily in your life. Listen, I daily read my Bible. I daily study my Bible. We, stand, we daily open it and study the Bible. That's a revival. The churches today and the, and, the, and the Christians, they want a, oh, jump up and down and shout out hallelujah. Friend, that dies. Because then you got to get something greater to have hallelujah. You know, we had the bean and supper meal. Now we got to have, oh, you got to have the fried chicken and the waffle tickets. Oh, man, now we got to have, we, we, we got to have a fellowship and something more than, because we got out to the fellowship that we just had. Because people are going to say, oh, it's the same. we got to do something more. Oh, then wait a minute. Behind closed doors. we got to do something better because the church that I was, they had a great fellowship. And i got to top that fellowship. So when I go to preachers' meetings, I can tell them how many people we have and what we did. Come on, behind preachers' doors. Those preacher conferences. You know, when the preachers leave those conferences and they go down to the hotel lobby and they check out and they gotta they gotta pay for the x-rated films they've been watching all week and don't let the congress don't let the church pay for that because someone's gonna know uh -huh. yeah i've got ambassadors who've been to those meetings and i've heard their reports where your good pastor behind that church is watching pornographic movie when he's away from his family in the hotel room and some of them, at, in between the, the, the things, they go up down to the bar and have a couple of drinks. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's, that may be your pastor. And your pastor may be psyching you up for a great revival at your church. And all he's doing it because the pastor that he knows had a great psyching and great revival in his church. And he has to top that. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to start teaching the truth that I know now. When it comes up relevant, I'm going to show you what some of those pastors do. I'm going to start revealing and talk. That's part of my doctor of Dr. Stolly William Hayward, a doctor in theology. Those were some of the classes I had to take on what other pastors do. You know, like every all eyes closed. I see that hand, and there was no hand because I look. When they say all eyes are closed, not mine. I like making pastor flyers. O Jerusalem, wash thy heart from the wickedness. There's repentance. There's confession. There's cleaning up. That thou mayest be saved. 
Today is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves our soul. It's still a washing of our heart. You became a new creature, but let's not sing happy birthday to the new birth. Let's keep on saying happy birthday to the old birth. When you were born in dead, when you were born in sins and trespasses again, happy birthday to the, no. Let's sing happy birthday to the new birth. I'm a new creature. I've been adopted by God. I'm God's child. I'm no longer a child of the devil. Ask your pastor that. Walk up to your pastor and say, Pastor, why do we celebrate the old birth and not the new birth? And, uh, well, many people don't remember the day they were born again. Your fault. Your fault, Pastor. Because everybody who's been saved by, uh, to the Lord, when God's using me, I'm trying not to say I save them, because I don't, I tell them, you mark this day, you write this day, and they got a Bible, I will write that date in. I say, this date you may not completely understand, but this is the most important day. You may not understand. Today you were born again, and I'll take them over to Luke 15 and show you where the angels in heaven rejoice. I tell them, show them. If your pastor doesn't do that, your church is not taught that, Okay. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge with thee? Uh-oh. Getting the thoughts. Thoughts of sins. I don't hear that out of pulpits. Your thoughts are sins just as much as your actions because your actions and your thoughts are verbs. And a verb is action. Many and all, many people, judgment seat of Christ, great white throne judgment, they're going to be shocked to realize what they thought will be put on display. Well, boss, I never killed my boss, but you thought about it. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after in his heart. Think about all the people showing up for adultery. I, I, I didn't cheat on my wife. No, but you did with your brain. Your heart. For a voice declareth in Dan, that's north. That says north, Israel. And published affliction from Mount Ephraim. It's a little bit lower. That's Israel gone. You won't believe what happened to us. We don't care. We still want the Queen of Heaven. You don't see our red hiney? God will never do it to us. We're not bad as you are. I mean, after all, Christmas and Easter, that's two celebrations of the year. That's the two times that people come out to church. If people raise the name of Jesus on, on Christmas. You don't have Holy Wrench Week, do you? You don't have the great screwdriver day, do you? Stolly, what do you say? You know, when that mechanic drops that wrench and the screwdriver makes him crush his fingers on the engine. But, ah, Jesus! Well, they used the name of Jesus, didn't they? Listen, I went to school for a lawn, lawnmower mechanic. I worked on lawnmowers and very rarely that I took the marine engines. And I would smash my finger sometimes. I crushed my finger working on... Ah, Jesus! We don't have the lawnmower God, do we? I mean, they use Jesus working on automobiles, don't they? I mean, when a cook accidentally drops too much salt in the stew, ah, he's using the name of Jesus. So it's got to be his birthday in the kitchen. And when you look online, the fact is that you can buy anything with the name of Jesus attached to it. Proves to you just because they say Jesus at the end of the year. You know, there was a period in history of England. Christmas had nothing to do with Jesus at all. It was a time of festivity. It was a time of orgies. And eating and, and, and gallivanting and, and drinking and gluttony. All without the name of Jesus. There was a time of America in the period... You, you didn't have that glut. You didn't have those holidays. Those holidays were gone. And the Puritans would put the Baptist church to shame on how well they lived. 
the Puritans would arrest a gambling and selling alcohol. And don't tell me they don't, because of one family member I had on the on the, the Mayflower, I had a family member on the Mayflower, I forget his name now, he was arrested by the Puritans in Massachusetts for having a tavern and gambling and selling alcohol on the Sabbath. That's in my family. I read his book. There's a man that was on the Mayflower in my family, there's a written book about him, and he writes in there how the Puritans will put you Baptists to shame. And maybe God would call a Puritan saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and put you to shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, you had Christmas in your... We didn't have Christmas at all. And we had no taverns around our place of worship. If we did, we put them, on, we put them in persecution. We shut them down. Then you came up with church and state, and you got to have all freedom of all the religion. Then you went to mess. And then I know the Puritans turned the Congregationalists, and then they persecuted the Separatists. And the Baptists today don't even you know who the separate uh, and pray, you know, Baptist, Baptist, Baptist. I didn't say the word separatist. I'm afraid he wouldn't know what that word was. And I studied the separatist movement in Norwich, Connecticut. And I visit the spots where blood of the separatists. I'm more of a separatist than I'm a Baptist. But what's a separatist? Okay. I'll leave you in your ignorance. Go up to your pastor and ask him what a separatist is. Go up and ask him. And if he gives you a BS answer, it gives you, doesn't know that, you contact me, Jesus Christ, blessed hope at gmail.com. And I'll, sh I'll tell you what a separatist is. Separatists were before the Baptist. All right. I don't know how I got off on that, but still. Make ye mention to the nations. You're supposed to tell the nations, Israel. What are they telling the nations? We'll take your gods. We'll worship your gods. We'll bring your holidays into our worship. Pretty soon they're going to say the Queen of Heaven. Long before the Catholic Church shows up. We'll get to that, Lord willing. Publish against Jerusalem. Tell the nations my people have sinned. I got a preacher mad at me because my post on Facebook. It makes our church look bad. Well, I'm doing what Jeremiah did. You know, sorry, a lot of Christians, a lot of unsaved people know what I'm saying is true. It's too bad you don't. The heathen know. Don't you hide from them. They know better. You're only fooling yourself. That watchers come from a far country, Babylon, Daniel 4.17, and give out the voice against the cities of Judah. There's a time coming. There's a time coming. Babylon's coming. Get right. Jesus is coming, but we don't know when Jesus is coming. We don't know what persecution will come before Jesus. What if God does send the persecution? You realize if God does send persecution before Jesus, you realize how many churches are going to fold up? You know how many churches folded up with COVID-19? How come they're more able to check your temperature at the church door rather than what Bible, if you bring a Bible? They're more prone to make sure you wear a mask and stay six feet away from each other than to make sure you got the right Bible doctrine. And I get chastised because I try to tell Christians about the era of Christmas and Esther. I get chastised because I try to tell the era of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I get chastised. And I've been persecuted. I've been persecuted by pastors. I've been persecuted by churches. I've been persecuted by Christians. I've been persecuted by family. I've been persecuted by the world. I've been persecuted by the unsaved. I've been persecuted by the devil. Persecution comes up. It ain't going to be nothing new to me. I'll still keep doing what I'm doing. Because I'll still keep on doing what I'm doing. What about you? And how many churches have been closed? Ah, oh, okay. As the keepers of the field, are they against her roundabout? The faithful people are taking care of the fields. Whether they animals or crops. Well, Babylon, Assyria is going to be just as faithful to be against you. This is thy wickedness. Because it is bitter. 
You don't want anything to have anything with bitter. I I was bitter against a man one time, and it, it, it eats you a lot. I thank God I got victory over it. Bitterness, it, it just eats you. And the devil wants me to get bitter, and I'm, I'm not doing it. Because it reaches unto, what's that? Heart. And when that bitterness gets to your heart, you better have prayers and blood like dynamite. My balls inside you. My balls inside you. I am pain at the, my very heart. Heart trouble. My heart making the noise in me. I've had that. I've been laying there like, you okay? What are you doing down there? I know I'm not. You know I know I'm not talking about the regular heart, but you know that's not normal. It may be normal. It's just I cannot hold my peace. That's me. That's Jeremiah. I can't shut up. Later on, Jeremiah's like, I give up. That's it. I'm gonna shut up. I I, I am. I've been there. And then actually, you know, you find yourself witnessing. You find yourself preach. Find yourself. Uh, I thought I said, <laughs> God's up in heaven laughing. I know. You know, again, I had preachers, and you all not get this great. You all not be saying the things you're saying. Evidently, you've never been in my shoes. You haven't been in Jeremiah's shoes. You haven't been in Job's And I don't ever want to be in Job's shoes. I've been in Jeremiah's shoes except for prison, but I've been in a prison ministry. I got to get out. When everybody, including your kinship, is against you. And I've had Christians say, well, I don't want to park next to their car because there's too much scripture on it. Uh, where do you stand? I cannot hold my peace because thou has heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet. Not the sound of the trump. The trumpet. We saw that in verse 5. The alarm of war. That's coming. Calvary is coming. Not for a defense, for an offense. Armies are coming against you, Judah. Now, I've read the end of the book. And I've read the Lamentations. You know, they're going to eat their own babies. That's bad. The Bible says, I forget which book it is, says the delicate woman. I mean, a woman, she's sophisticated. She's educated. She's got the right clothes. She's got the right law. She's got the right people. She's got the right of all right, but she's not righteous. And she's going to pull that baby in between her legs. She's going to look to the left. She's going to look to the right. She's not even going to have her husband. She's going to go off in a room all by herself. And she's going to boil that baby. And she's going to eat that baby. And she's not even going to share it with her husband. Well, if they're making that would never happen to me. Oh, yeah. Better be careful what you say. Because last year, in America, 2020, all Americans went all upset because there was no toilet paper to wipe their behinds. You Listen, we've been in all these stores. Food is disappearing off the shelves. I told my daughter the other day, I've worked in groceries. I've been in four or five grocery stores. I've been in two home stores, automotive stores, and car stores. I, I, I've been, my field, my secondhand career has been grocery stores. I told my daughter today, I said, I wish I worked in the grocery store right now. Because I had to front the stores in my aisle before I left my shift. And the front is, is, you had to take every product and pull it up front, turn the labels so all the labels were the right way. Everything was at the edge and proper to the edge of the shelf. The grocery stores today, don't. there are big, wide holes. We had to fill those holes with something. There ain't nothing even to fill those holes today. When you look at those grocery stores, you better read the book of Jeremiah. Oh, I'm going to get a gun. Eat the bullets. What, are you going to kill somebody for food? That's a great Christian attitude. 
Destruction upon destruction. What's that? What was it? Ten hurricanes came last year? More than that. And many of them hit one part of the United States, the Gulf. Then they were having tornadoes on top of the, the hurricane. That's destruction upon destruction. And for some, they didn't get their EBT card to get their free food that they didn't earn. Is cried. The whole land, not the whole earth, the whole land, Israel, Judah, is spoiled. That could mean the army's taking it. It could be also, what about the fig trees? What about the grape? They've all been spoiled. How about that? There's nothing good. I mean, if you got a, a, a head of lettuce and it's all black. I grabbed a black uh, banana out of the refrigerator last night. It's kind of hard to eat around a mushy banana. Spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled. All right, that's not spoiled. They've come into your dwelling and took what you had. They're breaking into your house. Wait till they defund the police in America and let all the prisoners out of the, your house is going to be broken into. And my curtains, in a moment, that's what closes the tent. That's what a tent is made of. How long... Shall I see the standard, the flag, the war, the Babylonian standard, and hear the sound of the trumpet? Verse 5 and verse 19. For my people is foolish. They have no fear of God. They have not known me, God speaking. They are sottish, stupid, dull, very foolish, very stubborn. That's God talking about his own people. Imagine what God says about his people. Read Revelation chapter 3. Oh, look, at, look how great our church is. Look how great our pastor is. Look how great. God says, you're poor, miserable, naked, blind. And I'm standing outside the door knocking. But to do good, they have no knowledge. Wow. Put that on America, England, China, and the churches. Denomination and non-denomination. Now we're going to stop there because we're going to come up with an interesting subject next time, Lord willing.